Hello, everyone. I am here today with Stefan Spencer, who is an internationally recognized SEO expert and best-selling author. He is the co-author of The Art of SEO, author of Google Power Search, and co-author of Social E-Commerce, all published by O'Reilly. The Art of SEO, now in its third edition and weighs, weighing in at nearly 1,000 pages, is considered the Bible on search engine optimization and boasts testimonials from such industry, industry giants such as Seth Godin and Tony Shea and is even used as a textbook at universities. Stefan has spoken at countless hundreds of Internet marketing events, including all the major and e-commerce conferences such as SES, SMX, Pubcom, Internet Retailer, Shop.org, Etel, among others. He's been a contributor to the Huffington Post, Multi-Channel Merchant, Practical E-Commerce, Search Engine Land, DM News, and Marketing Profs, among many others as well. And today we are going to be talking about link building. And as you can tell by Stefan's bio, he has a lot of intelligence on this matter, and we're very interested in digging in. Stefan, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. Yeah, no problem. Glad to have you back, and I think we're going to be digging into a topic that should, if it's not of interest to everyone, it should be, but it most likely is going to be of interest to pretty much every person who's involved in marketing or business or anything because, as we know, uh, getting up on the search engines is very important, and link building is a very, very, very big part of that. So just to kind of dig into everything, uh, just can you just give a quick overview on what link building is and, and why it's important. Right. So Google has said recently that there are the three biggest signals that they use in the rankings algorithm. One is relevance, two, links, and three, rank brain. Rank brain being their artificial intelligence or more technically accurate machine learning algorithm, which is now running across 100% of all search queries when they announced it last year. Google said that it was running on 15% of search queries. Now they've announced it's running across 100%. So artificial intelligence is going to be the future as far as SEO and, um, and Google and, and the organic results are concerned. But in the meantime, until the, the big AI takes over and we become slaves to our robot overlords, um, we're going to have to make relevant content and um, get links to that relevant content in order to be considered important and appropriate for users uh, of Google. So that's kind of the underlying algorithm. I'm just super oversimplifying things because there are lots and lots of signals that Google uses, but really links are foundational to your Google rankings. No links, no rankings. And so if you want to rank well in Google, and you should, no matter what your business is, because even if you have a very small clientele and it's usually referral-based, guess where the referred person is going to check to see mm -hmm. if you're legit, if that referral was a good one. They're going to type in your name into Google and see what comes up. You really, in all cases, need to be in control of what shows up in those Google search results. So yeah. links are the, the future, and until the AI takes over, um, we're still going to need to do link building. Gotcha. Well, uh, yeah, I mean, you, you sort of uh, simplified it, but yeah, you, I mean, you, you've basically given everybody, you know, if you're not paying attention, start paying attention because it's very, very important. And you're right, you know, just because you're not going to be ranking for the most high traffic, um, you know, keywords or phrases in the world, it's still super important for the, for what you mentioned, even if you only have a small client base, because people are going to check you out. I mean, they just will. It's 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 almost almost pretty much 100 percent of the time these days. But before moving on to how we get these links, um, I'd like for you to pri provide any insight on like keywords or keyword phrases you might want to rank for that you possibly haven't thought of yet. How how can one go about finding those? Yeah, so there's there's a great uh, tool for free from Google called the Google AdWords Keyword Planner um, that requires you to have an AdWords account. So just um, if you have a Google account, sign up for AdWords, put in your credit card number, 
uh, you'll be prompted to set up your first campaign. Just don't hit go on it. And now you can put in keywords into the keyword planner that you want to check the popularity of. And it'll give, come back with numbers on an average monthly basis. Here's the search volume. There's a little icon next to the number that um, it looks like a, like a chart. Mouse over that uh, chart icon, and you'll see the historical trend over the last 12 months. So there's a lot of seasonality in the keyword, like some sort of, uh, um, I don't know, like something that sells out uh, during the holiday season, for example. You'll see a big spike during November, December, and it'll drop off in January. So you can see that historical trend, which a lot of people don't even realize that they just mouse over that little icon to get that. Uh, so that's a great free tool. Uh, there's another free tool from Google, which doesn't give you the numbers. It's all kind of relative based. is uh, called Google Trends. And one great feature of Google Trends, and that's at trends.google.com. One fantastic feature that is little known about Google Trends is you can switch from web search. There's a little pull down where it says web search, you can choose the option YouTube search and see how many uh, relative, uh, remember, not, there's no hard numbers in this tool, but you can see relatively what keywords are popular with YouTube searchers. Okay. And YouTube's the number two search engine. And this is a really important thing to know. Like, it, it, and by the way, if you are not, uh, if you're neglecting YouTube, you're really missing out because it's the number two search engine. More search queries happen on YouTube than on Bing or Yahoo. So you need to have a channel or multiple channels. You need to have videos. You need to do SEO of those videos. Think about what, what keywords are popular with YouTube searchers. Incorporate those relevant popular keywords into the title of your video, into the description of the video. Put a, uh, a clickable link, you know, a full URL in, in the beginning of your description so uh, people will click on, on that link, end up on your website or your landing page. It's a lot to do with YouTube. And if you haven't thought about that, well, <laughs> you know, they say that uh, you should have been doing this years ago, but the second best time to be doing this is today, right? So start now focusing on YouTube, and that's a great little feature inside of uh, Google Trends that most people don't even know about is that YouTube search. So those are a couple of free tools, and then there's some paid tools you can use as well, like um, um, oh, KeywordTool.io and uh, KeywordDiscovery.com from Trellian. Um, uh, there's a brand new tool came out this year from Moz, part of the Moz uh, tool set. It's called Keyword Explorer. That's a great tool. There's a bunch of great tools out there for keyword research. What would be your favorite one if you had to endorse the top one or two for uh, paid well, tools? For paid tools, actually there's one more that I'll mention, or no, two more I'll mention that this is a really powerful feature to basically to spy on your competitors and get keyword lists of your competitors. And the two tools I'll mention for that are SEM Rush and Search Metrics. SEM Rush and Search Metrics both have this feature where you can put in a competitor URL and then see a, a nice big list of um, both organic keywords and paid keywords. So if they're advertising on Google and AdWords, then uh, you can see which uh, keywords that they're buying in AdWords as well. But you can see this big long list of organic keywords where they're ranking and getting traffic. Now the, these are estimated numbers. It, these tools are scraping the Google search results and um, they're taking estimates of search, uh, or they're taking the search volume numbers from the Google Keyword Planner. They're taking an kind of an estimated number of uh, uh, for traffic based on average click-through rates for the average position where that uh, uh, competitor is, is showing up for that particular keyword. So if they on average show up at position two, and let's say that the average uh, click-through rate for position two is 10% you know, or whatever it is, then um, search metrics and SEMrush are going to do the math and say that these are the, this is the estimated amount of traffic that 
we're expecting and uh, imagine kind of almost like hacking into your competitors' Google Analytics, that's what you can do with these two tools, kind of. I mean, it's, it's, it's an yeah. estimate, but it's pretty darn uh, uh, powerful to get a big long list of your competitors' keywords. And so I guess I would say, I know you asked for one tool. I'm just going to give you both <laughs> as yeah, my answer. No, no. Like those are my two favorite tools for doing uh, kind of competitive intelligence type of keyword research. Okay. Well, thank you for that. There's some great pointers. Now, um, again, we're going to be getting into how, how to get links, but wanted to lay some foundation here. Um, what about uh, identifying what links you currently have? H how does one go about figuring that out? Right. So. Um, there are a bunch of great tools for doing link analysis. Uh, so just to kind of bridge the two topics between keywords, which we were just talking about, and, and links, when people use um, certain keywords in their anchor text, in the, in the link text that they're pointing to your site, Google associates those words with the page that you're linking to. So if uh, you know if somebody's linking to you and they're using the words "click here" or "check this out" or "read more," then those are the words that are considered relevant to your page. Uh, versus if somebody put a really great keyword phrase in there, now this gets abused and then it looks unnatural and then you end up potentially getting penalized for this if you go over the top with it. But you want a diversity of uh, keywords showing up in links pointing to your pages and you want them to be relevant to your business and not just your brand name. I mean, it's going to be natural and expected that a bunch of the links will use your brand name as, as the anchor text. And yet, when we, um, when, whenever we can influence it and get somebody to use better link text, we should do that. So knowing what keywords are popular, which ones we want to rank for, it's really helpful also in our link building. And um, yeah, and another thing I'll mention about keywords, remember I, I, I mentioned at the very beginning, even if you're getting all your, your business from referrals and you don't care about uh, SEO on Google, you, we want to make sure that you have some level of control over what appears when people are searching for your brand name, your company name. That's called online reputation management. And having link authority that flows into your site ensures that you rank for your brand name, which you, you know, let's say that you do already. You say, well, I don't need SEO because I already rank for my brand name and I get all my business from referrals, so you know, I'm good. Well, you want to be able to manage your reputation, so having um, uh, the ability to um, bring to the table link authority, let's, let's say that points to social profiles, your Facebook, your LinkedIn, your Twitter, um, et cetera, so that those rank as well. And perhaps there are some uh, awards that your company has won, perhaps there are some uh, certifications that you have or whatever, and there, there are these different search listings that you want to show up highly ranked for your brand name too, you want links to point to those things as well as pointing to your website so that you're stacking the deck in your favor and not letting just random stuff appear on the first page of search results. So links are important for everybody. Mm -hmm. Now, again, just to, I mean, that, that, all that was really awesome to know and, and everybody, you know, especially for people who aren't thinking that SEO is important for them or, you know, the search engines aren't, uh, the results pages aren't important for them, that, that's some great pointers. Now, now, how do you identify that? How, how, where, where can you go to see actually what, where you currently stand with what links are coming into you? Yep. So I'm going to recommend four different tools. Um, Moz.com uh, has Open Site Explorer. You can go directly to Open Site Explorer by typing in opensiteexplorer.org. There's uh, Majestic. That's majestic.com. There's linkresearchtools.com. And then finally, ahrefs.com. 
Now, if we're talking about a site that you own, you can also get link data for free from Google Search Console, formerly known as Google Webmaster Tools. But if you don't own the site and um, you haven't you know, claimed it as, as your site within the verification process that uh, Google provides, then Google Search Console is not going to be helpful to you. You're going to try and reverse engineer where your competitors are getting links, and uh, thus you're going to need to use these, use these four commercial tools. Now, if you don't have unlimited budget and you're going to have to pick which tools of those four, um, I, I would recommend you, well, and, you know, it's like <laughs> which, which of your four children would you you know, is your favorite? Which one would you pick? It's like I don't know. Well, you, I, you don't need I, I to can't pick. Really I, mean, pick. I, I think you've given some good options. People can look into them, and you know, but budget, low budget, high budget, it's such a relative term, you know. So yeah, yeah. I, mean, I think you've given some people some good places to go check out and see what what works for them. And even the, you know, if they have zero budget, they can still go through um, and, and work within Google Analytics and Google AdWords and, and figure some things out that way. Now, well, uh, even if they don't. Even if they have no budget to spend, they, they'll get a couple of queries for free on the, some of these uh, paid tools that I mentioned. Like they can still get some metrics on like uh, page authority and domain authority, uh, Moz Rank, Moz Trust from Open Site Explorer from Moz for free for you know just a, a few queries. They can't get all the link data in terms of who's linking to this site or to this particular uh, page, but they they can get maybe the first 10 uh, links out of whatever, you know, number of, of, of links. So even if they have no budget, they can still, to a limited degree, use some of these tools. So definitely check into it even if you have no budget. Okay, cool. Now, um, you know, I've heard in the past there's actually links that can hurt you, you know, some bad links. How can you identify those, and maybe it's just kind of the same answer, these tools, um, but then what should someone do if they do find and identify, you know, something that is hurting them by linking to them? Right. So there are um, some particular tools that uh, analyze your, um, your links for toxic links. Um, one of my favorites is called Link Detox. And that's from the same folks who make link research tools. Uh, and, and that's one of those four tools I mentioned. So Link Detox triages your inbound links into three categories. Toxic links, suspicious links that need you to actually look and see if it's a toxic link or not, and then innocuous links that just are hurting you and hopefully helping you. but. Um, they're not a concern it's from a toxic link standpoint. So that's the tool I use. There's, there's some other tools out there that I don't have experience with, like Remove Them um, and Rmove and stuff, but uh, Link Detox is the one that, that I use. And then if I have to clean up a, um, a problem with toxic links for a client, then I'm looking at uh, a outreach tool to reach out to webmasters of these um, uh, linking sites that are toxic. So I'll use Pitchbox to do the outreach. And um, normally do, you do outreach for link building to get great links. In this case, we're doing outreach using the same tool, uh, Pitchbox, to get links removed. <laughs> which are kind of okay. ironic, but um, that's the first step in the cleanup process if you have toxic links. I mean, if you have just a few toxic links, then don't worry about it, but if you have uh, a, a non-negligible number, then you need to do a cleanup process, and Google has this um, this process that you uh, um, basically disavow is the, the technical term. You disavow these toxic links, but in order to, um, in, in order for those disavowed uh, links to actually get discounted, you have to put in the effort to try and get some of those actually removed. And that's why you have to go through this outreach process and say, hey, um, 
I would like that link removed on such and such page to my site. Uh, can you please do that? And if they don't, then you start getting nastier and nastier and like, okay, well, I haven't heard back from you and I really need this link removed. I would hate to report your site to Google in my disavow file uh, because, you know, it just would be better for both of us if you remove it. Yep. Cool. <laughs> so you, right. you got to go through this, this hard work, but then hopefully you'll pop out of the penalty that you're in, so. Okay. Yeah, very, very, very good advice there, and I think you've uh, given some people some good paths to take care of that. All right. Now let's move on to getting outside links. Uh, what are some best practices in order? You know, any ideas, any creative ideas that you might have to help people get some good quality link backs? Yeah. So we need to start thinking strategically and so tactically, and. This really means you got to think like a content marketer. So how are you going to create remarkable content that's worth sharing, that's worth linking to? It's link-worthy content. And one of the best ways, I think, to um, kind of uh, describe this kind of content is, is it remarkable? Is it worth remarking about? I'm using Seth Godin's definition of remarkable, worth remarking about, in other words. Uh, from his book, The Purple Cow. And so we're going to need to create content that's remarkable because if it's not remarkable, it's not worth being remarked upon, it's not worth spreading, it's not worth uh, people sharing it on social media and retweeting and plus wanting and um, you know posting it to Reddit and all that sort of stuff. And most importantly, for from an SEO perspective, it's not worth people blogging about and then linking to. Mm -hmm. So, so that's that's the prerequisite. And um, if you have, let's say, just an e-commerce website, big product catalog, that's not really link-worthy content. I was going to say, oh wow, you 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 know your your uh, plumbing supplies e-commerce site. I really should be blogging about that. I've been I've had that on my editorial calendar for the last few weeks, and I and I really need to get to that. <laughs> like, no, that's not going to happen. You have to you, the the onus is on you to create this kind of link worthy content, remarkable content. And okay, you're a plumbing supply company, where you probably are selling some um, things that would give you something fun or unexpected to to write about. Let's say that um, I don't know the post was a hundred the a hundred most uh, funniest, most remarkable urinals from around the world would be a, an example of a blog post where you don't have to go travel the world and take photos. You just hop over to sites like Flickr.com, F-L-I-C-K-R.com, a uh, photo sharing site, or to Google Images and set the, um, the, the advanced uh, um, search feature of, of um, licensing so that you can reuse this content and you're looking for images that you can reuse and uh, you're curating existing content, finding some funny pictures of urinals that you can assemble into a blog post and um, you know then you got something remarkable that you didn't have to put a ton of time into. Maybe it took you a few hours to find really funny um, urinal photos and uh, it's tangentially related. So now you've got this remarkable content. You post it to your blog, and you're like, "Okay, let the links come in. <laughs> I'm ready." <laughs> well, it's not going to work that way. You have to start getting some buzz happening, and the best way to do that is to have a power user in your hip pocket who will push it on their social media channels and. and Start like a snowball effect going where you know snowball starts out really small at the top of the hill, but you push it down the hill, and it, and it grows really fast after a little while. So you need that critical mass to form, and you're going to get that get the ball rolling with that snowball effect by pushing this out on social media. This remarkable piece of content, not just from your own account, because you don't have street cred in these online social communities like 
Facebook and Reddit and so forth and stumble upon, et cetera. So you need to utilize the power user. And uh, how are you going to find a power user? That's the hardest part of all of all this stuff. Even harder than coming up with remarkable content, which is something I help my clients do all the time. I'm brainstorming, ideating with them, R remarkable campaigns, different kinds of content pieces, not just listicle type of, you know, articles, hundred of the funniest whatevers and thirteen, uh, you know, scariest haunted hotels and all that sort of stuff, but also personality tests, quizzes, um, uh, viral videos and, and comics and um, uh, how-tos and buyer's guides and checklists and worksheets and downloadable tools and calculators and um, you know, WordPress plugins and browser extensions. And there's so many different areas that you could go into um, to create remarkable content. Uh, you could even get your users to uh, participate in this process, crowdsourcing the, the content, right? So um, the way you do that is you create like a, a video competition or um, some sort of contest. So they, they would submit their photos, their videos, or what have you t to enter this contest. And if you set it up right, you're actually going to have in the contest rules that they have to post it to their own channel. And then their uh, remarkable content that they're creating in order to enter your contest gets in front of all of their subscribers, all of their fans and followers. So a lot of nuances here, but you have to do this two-step process, step one being create the remarkable content, and step two, seed it into social media to get in front of the linkerati as your end game, your end goal is to get links, powerful links from authoritative, trusted websites, not just from random, you know, Jim Bob or whatever who has no authority in the eyes of Google, but really powerful websites, the linkerati. You know, and then and, uh, to describe it, you know. So how do you get in front of the Linkerati? Power users. So that's now, the step two, is getting all that stuff out there that you created that's remarkable. Okay, now obviously there's probably only so many power users and they probably get hit up all the time and it, it, for 99% of people it's going to be tough. And, and I think that's what, to kind of give Stephen a plug here, or Steph, sorry, Stefan a plug here, uh, I know that he does have the ear because he's one of the experts. So, um, he, you know, and over the years he's been able to do that. So if you're a, a big-time company that, that has a little bit larger budget, somebody like Stefan is somebody that can really help you out. But not everybody has that big of a budget. Not everybody is going to be able to be somebody like you, Stefan. So what's the next step down that people can do? And I'd like to bring up one suggestion and get your opinion on it and then have you talk about it or any other ideas. But, you know, I watched this video about link roundups, and I think you can just type in link roundups, but then, you know, there's all other kinds of words that you can use to find people. Is is that a good, um, you know, to start building up and finding these people who talk about your subject and start to reach out to them and hopefully, again, don't reach out to them if you have a bunch of crap that you're going to be sending them because these people, it's my understanding, are putting out high-quality content, you know, and they're aggregating some of it and, and compiling it from other, you know, either experts and or just remarkable type of content that's going to make them look good. Do you suggest that being maybe the first step if they're not able to get the ear of a power user? Uh, and if so, um, can you expound on that? Yeah, so I'm I'm really skeptical of uh, things that are uh, just seem too easy, <laughs> and where you essentially like buying links or uh, building low quality links. That's that's not um, sustainable, and that can get you in big trouble with Google, even if, if, even if it works for a little while. So back um, some time ago, all, all all the buzz was about like um, doing guest posting, guest blog posts. 
And now that's not something that is touted as a great link building tactic. I was never a fan of guest posting. If you are a columnist at um, a popular uh, blog or um, online news site like the Huffington Post, so I, I have a column with the Huffington Post, that was always a great idea. That's not guest posting. That's, um, so expert roundups, that's essentially the new guest posting. It's like, oh, well, this is our little scam for getting uh, uh, links these days. It's we'll go and, and reach out to uh, 100 different um, important bloggers on a topic that we want them to link to us, and we're going to tell them, hey, we've included you on our uh, on our list of important people to follow in this industry, whatever the industry is, on Twitter or, you know, whatever the the title of your expert roundup is. And, hey, we'd love to get a quote or something to go with uh, this um, mention of you in, in our article, in our uh, roundup. And uh, then the expectation is that they're going to link to that because, hey, they've just been mentioned with all these other amazing people and, and they want you know to be associated with all these other experts. But it's... Joe's random blog dot com, whatever your website is, it's not like you wrote a Huffington Post article of uh, you know hundred experts uh, in the plumbing industry on Twitter you must follow. No, it's just on you know random uh, Joe plumbing blog dot com or something. So the expert roundups, Google has mentioned you know that they take these with a grain of salt, and that's just. It's essentially the new form of guest posting. Just the latest quick and dirty uh, link building tactic du jour, and it's uh, it's not sustainable. So in answer to your question, what would somebody who doesn't have budget to work with me uh, or somebody you know of my caliber, what would they do? Use a tool like Pitchbox, which isn't free, um, but it's affordable sign up with that service, and then do outreach to get in front of influencers and have that remarkable content so it's not like uh, you're just um, hawking garbage and saying, hey, uh, you know, I've got this article on you know, 50 uh, safety tips for uh, Pokemon Go users or something, like don't walk in the street while you know, staring at your phone. You know, that's not useful. It's not remarkable content. Maybe it's mildly useful content, but every, that's been done to death. It's not remarkable. And you're trying to newsjack a topic of the day that's popular, like, you know, Pokemon Go. And that's just not you, – you haven't hit it yet. So you got to keep tweaking until you come up with something remarkable that – your friends and, and colleagues uh, agree that, yep, this is something worth sharing. This is something so good I'd even share it on my Facebook wall. So then you have to use a tool like Pitchbox to outreach to influencers in that topic area. You can put in a keyword, let's say it's Pokemon Go, and you see what uh, influencers have been talking about that topic on their blogs. You can set a threshold for minimum amount of Moz rank or uh, clout score, and um, or you know, there's some other metrics uh, that you can choose from as well. But a minimum threshold of authority, and then so that's topically relevant to your post. In this case, hypothetically, Pokemon Go. It uh, it's targeting influencers who are authoritative, like these are true influencers and not just random bloggers because of the high clout score, or high Moz rank or whatever that you've set. And then you do outreach. You have some templates to choose from. You can create your own templates. And um, the important thing is it shouldn't feel well, to the influencer who receives this email from you through the Pitchbox tool that it is just a spam, unsolicited kind of bulk email. It needs to feel like it's just an individual email to you and you alone as that blogger. Um, I've, I'm familiar with your blog or I'm familiar with your podcast. As a podcaster myself, I have two podcast shows, Marketing Speak and The Optimized Geek, both excellent shows. All your listeners should be uh, 
checking out my two shows, by the way. Um, <laughs> MurphySpeak.com and OptimizeGeek.com, end of plug. Um, so I get a lot of pitches, um, a, a lot of pitches from uh, just random people because of my podcast. Hey, I would love to be a guest, and um, here's my pitch. And, and it's clear to me that they have not even listened to any of my episodes. It's just a bulk email. Don't do that. <laughs> really make it feel handcrafted and try and give before you try and get. So think of a way that you could add value to them. Like if, as a HuffPo blogger, I blog for the Huffington Post, I could outreach using Pitchbox and say, hey, I'm writing an article for uh, to post on my um, Huffington Post column about XYZ topic, and as an expert, subject matter expert in that area, I'd love for you to weigh in with a quote, and I can interview you by email. I could interview you by phone or Skype, whatever your preference, but you know, I'd love to incorporate you into the article. That's a give instead of, hey, I have this great um, infographic, and I think your readers would love it. Here's the link, and here's the anchor text I'd love you to use when you link to me. Uh, like, no, <laughs> that's just nasty. It's just, no, oh, it feels dirty. It feels like I need to take a shower after getting that spammy, uh, you know, self-centered outreach request. So um, just be a good person. <laughs> yeah. Be a giver. Yeah. Gotcha. Now is, um, I believe there's another service, and I'd like to get your opinion on it, I think Buzzstream, that's familiar to Pitchbox. Is that correct? Yeah, I I would say Pitchbox is better. I'm a little biased because I've uh, done some advising for uh, Pitchbox, but um, yeah, Pitchbox has had a, a number of uh, Buzzstream users who have left Buzzstream and are happily now with uh, with Pitchbox. If you compare the feature set and the capabilities and stuff, um, yeah, Pitchbox is is uh, a Let better tool in my personal opinion. Okay, awesome. Yeah, so I, I think. I think we, you know these last few minutes here um, are, are going to apply to to the vast vast majority of people. Um, and, and in going through this, can you get lucky if you know you follow your best practices through going like through a pitch box? Can you? Is that how you can get lucky and find eventually a power user that sees your content and, and sees like, oh yeah, that that's some good stuff. I, I'd like to develop a relationship with them. Is that something that could potentially come out of this? It could, yes, it, it could. But um, even if you never got a power user that you can just uh, pay them every time to see your uh, remarkable content into social media, even if all you're doing is outreaching to influencers on a content piece by content piece basis and, um, you know, getting some hits sometimes and a lot of times not getting a response, but, you know, following up and hopefully it's remarkable content and they do think it's worth uh, sharing with their readers. You, you may never really need to have that power user in your hip pocket. It's just a really nice thing to have. So, um, you know, just keep uh, getting yourself out there, go to conferences. Like, I'll be speaking at Blogger in a couple of weeks. It, it's a women bloggers conference. And you might think, what, a guy at a women bloggers conference? <laughs> well, they didn't used to take men speakers up until just a few years ago, so then they did. And I love Blogger. It was actually at Blogger that my oldest daughter, at 16 years old, got her first speaking gig. Wow. And she, from there, just exploded with got like a dozen speaking gigs. She started blogging for the Huffington Post. She got written up in newspapers and has gotten on TV. And it all started with the Blogger Conference. So I love Blogger. And what a great place to go, whether you're a woman or man, doesn't matter. Go to that conference with the intention of networking with influential bloggers, women bloggers. This is the place to go. If you're into podcasting, then podcast movement is a great place to uh, network with influencers. These are influencers, power users that are podcasters. I mean, there are a lot of podcasters who are just getting started, too. And just like there are a lot of bloggers at Blogger who are just getting started, and, and that's fine, too, 
get yourself out there. If you're networking, building relationships, adding value, being just a good person, you will find some power users eventually. But you don't need it to succeed. You could still use a tool like Pitchbox, do outreach, and on a you know, content piece by content piece basis, as it's relevant, like you write something about Pokemon Go and you find some people who pick up on it because it's a really great article. You need a hook. You need to, uh, some sort of angle or approach to that article that makes it remarkable because there are, like I said, way too many articles out there about Pokemon Go and, and safety tips that's just not interesting to share anymore. Uh, you, you have to have a hook. Like there's a great... Um, uh, video that's going viral on Facebook now, um, the Miami Police Department, this guy in a uniform is talking about Pokemon Go and, uh, and safety. It's a great video. It's going viral. So that was a, a, an interesting hook, having a police officer who's really cool and personable talking people through on the video all the safety tips. And he's obviously quite knowledgeable about Pokemon Go. It's kind of like he, he's, he's a police officer nerd. <laughs> it's kind of fun. So what's your hook? What's your angle that makes it special for people to want to share it? Because if you don't have that, none of the outreach is really going to pan out. Gotcha. Now, at Blogger, uh, how can people reach you? What hotel and what's your room number? No, I'm, I'm joking. <laughs> So, well, yeah, I think you've given some very good advice, and I think you, we've covered um, the span of, of people, you know, from zero dollars to, you know, fifteen grand a month to, to spend on this stuff. And uh, I think I think we we've, we've given people of, of all sorts um, uh, of stages of their business development uh, some really really good ideas, and I really appreciate that. And I think we have. Um, I had a question here about, you know, how can they start monitoring this as things start happening. I, I, I assume we could revert back to the beginning on some of those other tools as far as finding the links. They all they all will help you do that, if I'm not mistaken. And yep. uh, so I'm Yeah, you see so just those four tools. You just monitor and see what the impact is of all the content marketing and link building that you're doing to see if uh, links are showing up. Gotcha. So uh, the last, uh, I think, to tie all this the, you know, together or to kind of pick the last, you know, important part of all this is, is, on, is intralinking within your site. Um, can you just quickly go over some best practices there and um, of what people should be doing as they're linking within their site? Yeah. So and, and, the thing and, about outside, internal and, outside of, and outside of their site as well yeah, to, so to other people. <laughs> Okay, so here, here's the thing. When you are attracting links to your site, that conveys uh, trust. <clears throat> when you are linking yourself um, within your own site, <clears throat> there's no trust conveyed as far as Google is concerned. Okay, of course you trust yourself. That's why you're linking to yourself. So you... If all you're doing is linking to yourself, that doesn't get you a, a, a high ranking in Google. What you're doing when you're strategically uh, linking within your site to important pages and not so much to lesser not unimportant pages is you're giving Google a clue as to what's important of your content and what's not. So that's all. I mean, if I have a traditional sort of top nav or left side nav, those pages that are linked to in that nav are considered important to Google because they're considered important to me. I wouldn't be including them in my nav if they weren't important. So they'll get more um, rankings than deep pages that are buried in my site five clicks away from the home page. So that's why internal linking is important. You asked about linking to, the, to other sites from my site. Uh, well, that doesn't help anybody but the person you're linking to. If I am not linking out at all to other people because I'm greedy and I want to keep all the link authority for myself, that looks engineered and un unnatural. That's not how the web works. And Google's not going to like that, so don't be greedy. 
if you think that you're going to get higher rankings because you're linking to important sites like, I don't know, the National Science Foundation or Harvard University or something, no, no benefit at all for you, so you're wasting your time. Um, yeah, so just think about how, how can I be remarkable, how can I get great inbound links, and don't worry so much about how you're linking internally except from the standpoint of, I want to make sure my most important pages are not buried deep many clicks away from my home page. Gotcha. And, and I, I guess that's more of just the human flow part of all of this. If you have a, a remarkable article that, you know, is about something of similar topic within that, you just reference that so you can keep people going to the page that you know they're going to like and then spend more time, uh, which obviously is a, also helps with, with how Google, I, I think, looks at you, is how long people spend on your site and the click-throughs and all of that. So it helps. It's just not as important as some of these others as far as the SEO goes. All right. Well, awesome, Stefan. Um, really good stuff here. <laughs> I'm going to have to go back and listen to all of this again and dig into some of these tools and uh, I think uh, – we were looking at BuzzStream personally, so I think I'm going to go ahead and flip over to PitchBox based on your recommendation so you can tell PitchBox you, you got them a new new account. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, sign up for the free trial at a minimum and, and give, it a, give it a go and see what you think. I'm, lo it's, it's lo I'm looking at it right now. I'm looking at it right now. Well, very cool. Uh, Stephen, how can people continue to learn from you? Yeah, so I have uh, multiple websites, but uh, the main one would be stephanspencer.com. There's a whole resource area there with videos and archived webinars, uh, white papers, checklists, worksheets, all sorts of great stuff there. And um, also on stephanspencer.com, you'll get uh, links to my two podcast shows that I mentioned earlier, Marketing Speak and The Optimized Geek. I've had incredible guests like some of the top, top people in, um, in marketing, on Marketing Speak, people like Jay Abraham, and on The Optimized Geek, which is uh, like a personal transformation podcast. I've had uh, folks like Byron Katie and um, Harville Hendricks, Phil Town, and Dave Asprey on, so some huge, huge names in the self-development space. So both shows are awesome, and you can find those um, from stephanspencer.com as well. All right, and just uh, for people who are listening to this and not reading it, uh, it's uh, www.stephanspencer.com, and I believe uh, Stefan's Twitter handle, correct me if I'm wrong, is S-S-P-E-N-C-E-R. Is that correct? That's it. Yep. All right, awesome. Well, thanks so much, Stefan. Uh, looking forward to uh, our next one, uh, but I think uh, this one will give a little, people uh, a lot of homework <laughs> and, and a lot of stuff to dig into. Really appreciate your time. Oh, it's been a lot of fun. Thanks for having me. All right, thanks, Stefan.